Hello and welcome to the Wildlife Moto channel. So in today's video, we're going to cover the refurbishment of my 42 year old instrument cluster on the BMW R100 CS. This is the original twin dash made by Motometer. And I think you'll agree it forms an integral part of the bike's timeless cockpit style design. So I was really keen to preserve this, refresh it and give it a new lease of life for many happy miles on the road ahead. Now I'm going to show you what I've done with my dash. And I I imagine that a lot of these dashes from around this period are pretty similar in design. So hopefully there's some helpful information in this video, but I do want to remind everyone that I'm definitely not an expert. This is just what I did. And it's one of those jobs that at face value, it should be pretty straightforward. But I can tell you now this wasn't. It was actually a massive pain. And there are multiple opportunities in this process to completely mess up and end up destroying your housing or your original parts. So do set aside plenty of time for this. And remember, if you do muck up your housing, you're likely on the hook for around 200 pounds for a new one. BMW don't make them anymore. They are available in the aftermarket, but they are flipping expensive. So looking close up, this 42 year old cluster has certainly seen better days. The original rubber visors have gone pretty powdery and are stretched out, but removing the visors reveals some more of the bigger problems. You can see here that these aluminium surrounds for the original glass lenses are completely rotten, mainly at the bottom of the unit where water has clearly pooled over time. And I bet these clocks leak like an absolute sieve now, so we need to address this. The solution here is obviously to replace the lenses and I picked up these new units from Motorworks here in the UK. The first thing to note with the replacement glass is that, well, it isn't actually glass at all. These units are made out of acrylic and there are obviously pros and cons to this. A couple of pros being safer than glass, also quite easy to maintain. But a really big con with acrylic is that it's very susceptible to getting damaged when exposed to the wrong types of chemicals. For example, if you were silly enough to clean these lenses with a solvent like acetone, you can expect something like this to happen and absolutely ruin them really, really easily. So you've got to bear that in mind moving forwards if you go ahead and install acrylic lenses on your dash. So the first step in this process is to remove all of the delicate internal parts from the housing. These screws on the back of the case were actually quite badly seized in place. So to get them out, I had to soak them for a while in a little bit of this plus gas just to free them up without stripping their heads. All of these outer screws are going to be replaced with stainless steel screws when we get round to reassembling. So as well as ordering new screws, I've also got new gaskets for the internals as well. And I've got these LED lights, which are going to replace the standard incandescent bulbs behind the dials. These are going to be brighter, they're going to last longer, and they're green, which is going to look amazing. So with the backing off, there are more screws inside that hold in place things like the speedo mechanism, the rev counter, and the lighting panel. With these removed, I carefully lift out each of the units. The rev counter is attached to the lighting panel by three very thin wires, so you've got to be careful with those. And you've also got to be extremely careful not to damage this flexible printed circuit board for the lighting panel. I'm also being really careful when handling the original dials. These are so expensive if you want to replace them, so you don't want to get fingerprints all over them, and you definitely want to be careful not to knock the needles around or scratch the dials during removal. So it turns out my dials are actually in really, really good condition. Even if they weren't, I would probably not dare to try and fix these. I'd send these off to an expert. But for now, I can go ahead and store these safely out of the way. So with all the internals gone, I can now get on with the messy task of removing the stock glass. Now, the BMW parts are made of real glass, and if your lenses are cracked or slightly chipped, you're going to want to be careful here because chances are you might break them further during extraction. The first step is to pry away this rotten outer aluminium ring. This was quite easy to do for me because it was already split, so I just kind of peeled this off. Then gently pushing from behind, the original glass lenses should pop out fairly easily. So all pretty simple and straightforward so far, but not for long. You see, BMW, in their infinite wisdom, installed the glass with a plastic retaining ring, which they glued to the main plastic housing, forming a bond so strong that not even a state of quark-gluon plasma could possibly 
hope to break it free. So while the glass lens is out, the plastic retaining ring is still very much stuck to the housing. Now this ring has to be dealt with one way or another, either removed or reshaped so that the new acrylic lenses can be seated correctly. As you can see, the new glass has got this ridge on the underside. It's quite different to the flat stock lens. So in order to fit this, we're going to need some creative thinking. First, I tried to perform a surgical procedure with my scalpel to try and pick out the glue and pull the ring off. But in the end, I resorted to this. With all hope of actually being able to remove the ring gone, I'm just sanding it back slowly with a Dremel to the point where the new glass will fit in place. Now I had to do multiple test fits to make sure I'm not eating away too much of the housing and end up with nothing left to glue it to. I guess it's a bit like how a dentist might fit a crown. We need to keep as much of the original tooth as possible so as to provide a good mounting surface. So getting the outer circumference filed back is one task. The second task is that the original ring also had a raised lip on it, which now needs to be flattened back off. Now what we're trying to do here is ensure that when fitted, the bottom of the glass has approximately a 2mm gap to the instrument housing. And it's this 2mm gap that's going to be used by the visor to grip around the lens. If that gap's too big, you're going to have a bit of a space between the visor and the housing. Not a massive problem, but too small and you'll likely never get the rubber in place. And that is a problem. So it's possibly best to err on the side of slightly too tall rather than too short when doing this job. And as you can see here, this is just a case of filing the top of the ring slowly, reducing that height down and test fitting with the visor in place so as to monitor the size of that gap between the rubber and the housing. I decided to deliberately call it quits with a teeny tiny gap in place as I didn't want to risk overshooting and not being able to fit the visor in place at all. Also, a bit of a gap at this stage might be useful when it comes to water sealing the unit, as we'll see in a second. So once you're done with all your filing, the next stage in the process is to glue the lens in place. And assuming you didn't muck up your filing process, this is your second opportunity for an absolute catastrophe. Now in the lens kit, when you order two, you also get a bottle of this nasty stuff, 401 Loctite, aka super glue, aka cyanoacrylate. And I absolutely hate this stuff. It will destroy anything it touches, and even the fumes will happily haze up your plastic parts given half a chance. But horrid as it is, when used with acrylic, this stuff will bond like nothing else. So rule number one, don't spill it all over your lens, stupid. If you do that, it's game over. And rule number two, we want to do everything we can to avoid the vapors from this glue hazing up your transparent acrylic lenses. Yes, you heard that right. Even the vapors from cyanoacrylate will frost up these lenses under the right conditions. The problem is moisture. When this stuff is curing, it's outgasses like crazy, releasing monomers into the air that will cure on exposure to anything remotely damp. And that includes things like the oils from your fingerprints or any condensation on the lens. So if you've left a nice grubby fingerprint next to the bond line, dollars to donuts, you'll get a lovely hazy bloom right in the middle of your dash. These vapors are so good at finding fingerprints, forensic crime investigators actually use this process in crime scenes. So a few tips, number one, glove up. Number two, work in a warm, dry place with as little moisture around as possible. When the curing process starts, you can gently fan the area so as to try to disperse some of the vapors, but don't blow on it with your breath as that will introduce moisture. Don't enclose the unit by placing it face down during the cure either, or by reassembling too soon. That will trap the vapors inside and they'll hang around attacking your lens for longer. And my final tip, of course, would be to forget all of this. Go out, spend 200 quid, buy a new unit, have a nice day, and don't waste your time trying to do it yourself. But where's the fun in that? Now, chances are, even with all the precautions you've taken, you might get a small little bloom around the bond line. If this starts to happen, don't panic. Just leave it, let it cure, let it dry out. Now, when it's fully cured, you can use a tiny bit of this stuff to try to remove it. Just gently go over with a cotton ball or a brand new microfiber until any haze or light scratches are completely gone. Superglue is essentially very similar to acrylic chemically and Polywatch will actually deform the surface 
causing the particles to flatten off. It's used by a lot of vintage watch collectors whose crystals are often made out of plexiglass and it really is quite amazing stuff for getting rid of small little scratches and haze and stuff like that. It's definitely 100% worth keeping some of this in your cleaning kit moving forward to just buff these things up during everyday use. Now, I didn't get a major bloom, but I did decide to go ahead and polish my lenses anyway, as they were less than perfect out of the box, and a couple of minutes going over it with this stuff, they are absolutely crystal clear. So if all of this talk of blooming and frosting and polishing is putting you off, the solution might be to use a different type of glue. I did consider using a two-part epoxy and giving it a solid 48 hours or so to cure. But as I said, chemically 401 and acrylic is going to give you a really rock solid bond. I did, however, use some of this epoxy to shore up some of these hairline cracks around the brass inserts on the housing. These parts are notorious for cracking, so anything to add a little bit of strength here is definitely a good thing. These cracks normally happen when people over tighten the screws in the housing, so I'd recommend using the smallest precision screwdriver possible when you're doing things back up just to help you avoid the chance of accidentally over torquing something. So before reassembling, I've got to be 100% sure that this seal is water resistant. So this is where it could go horribly wrong. Now what I did is I stuffed some tissue inside each of the lenses and I just held it under the tap for a while. Thankfully, I didn't get any water ingress whatsoever and the tissues inside stayed perfectly dry. Having said that, for a bit of extra cheap insurance, I decided to run a few turns of PTFE tape around the rim of each lens. Now this will be clamped in place with the visor and will be totally hidden from view. So it's worth doing something like this or maybe even a bit of silicon sealer, something like this stuff from VTech if you want to be absolutely sure that you've got a watertight seal here. But you've got to be careful if you're using silicon because do remember you need that gap for the visors to be able to clip back in place. So if you fill it with silicon, that's not going to work. I was able to fit my visors perfectly back in place having gone around it with about three turns of PTFE tape. So before putting everything back together, I'm now going to go ahead and install my retro green LED panel lights. These are T10 size bulbs and fit perfectly inside the original factory housing. Just remember that the D in LED of course stands for diode, which means they do have a particular polarity, unknown to me at the moment. So it's gonna be a case of trial and error. When I turn the bike on, we'll see what one's lit up, if any, and flip them around until we are good to go. Finally, we've got to install these replacement gaskets. Now, the stock foam units were okay. They weren't in terrible condition, but it is cheap insurance to go ahead and get this job done while I've got everything open. I've got two foam gaskets that are kind of like L shapes that will stick to the back of the light panel. The old parts came off pretty easily, but there was quite a bit of grit and dirt hanging around. So I just cleaned off the area with a little bit of contact cleaner first. I also used a little cocktail stick just to make a small dowel to ensure that the holes are perfectly aligned and just kind of gets us squared up for sticking down the rest of the gasket. There's also a foam gasket that sits around the lighting panel. Now there's no adhesive to this so it just drops in place nice and easy. And finally we have this long thin gasket for the housing unit. Kind of looks like one of those licorice shoelaces. It just clips between these retainers on the outskirt of the unit and they will just seal it shut when everything is screwed down. Now while I was fitting this I had a bit of a genius idea for reusing the old seal. It turns out it fits perfectly in the small gap that I left between the visor and the housing housing, providing a little bit of extra sealing and finishes off the look perfectly. With all the new gaskets in place and the new glass fitted, now I just have to reinstall all of the original components. I dropped the speedo in first, then the mounting bracket, then went ahead and installed the rev counter and the lighting panel, making sure that this is correctly wired up again. Lastly, everything is screwed in place with the original screws for the internal parts. Now there are quite a few screws to go around here, so you've got to make sure that these are all present and correct. And don't over tighten them, I'm just using a small screwdriver to do this. Finally, the outer 
outer casings go on with my new stainless steel screws. And that's it, she's watertight. We've got new lenses, we've got new gaskets and new bulbs. And I've also ordered a new set of tiny little water transfer stickers that I'm going to try and use to restore the font on the dash because that's well worn out. I've got absolutely no idea if that's gonna work, but I will post something if we have any luck with that. So that's it, that's how I refurbished and rebuilt my instrument cluster on my BMW R100 Classic Sports. If you want to follow the build in its entirety, you can hit subscribe as there are lots of videos on the way for this bike. That's it for now, until the next one, ride safe.